peak time from 15 employees to 75 employees. So it's a totally different ball game. Um, so we are now looking at the structure of the business. Um, they called me in to do a, a time to 20 day project where we will be looking at the organisation structure, the organisation chart, all of the job descriptions for the employees. We will be setting up uh, very rigid and fixed interview questions for each role based on the person specs that we've created for each job description. Um, we will be installing all of those. So these kind of things are very key and important as you grow, but also if you start off with these things, these building blocks, it's extremely beneficial to the business. Can I ask if anyone's really bored yet? No. No, no, good, good. Let you know. What did you do if you were bored? Uh, if you were bored, I'd say let's have a bio break. Have a walk around, have a bit of fresh air, because it is hot in here. Have a, have a glass of water or something, and I'll unfortunately have to come out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> Contracts of employment, yet again, uh, ooh, the amount of times people say, oh, do I have to do this? Contracts of employment, or a statement of terms in particular, so you have eight weeks from the date you employ someone to issue that statement of terms in particular, or that contract of employment. Failure to do so is a breach of Section 1 of the Employment Rights Act. So it's quite important that this document is issued. It also means that it enables you to put into the contract things that are going to protect you, protect your business, and ensure that your employee knows exactly where they stand from day one. So the important factor for me there is when you're recruiting, is to send out your offer letter. If it's accepted, immediately send out your contract. So you should have that contract ready. The amount of companies that contact me and say, Hi Sue, I've been recommended to you for your services. Um, I've just taken on two or three employees. Um, I'm thinking of doing a few contracts now. For me, that's cart before horse. You know, the way that it should have been done is the contracts are produced before you decide to take on employees. So we can explore together what exactly you're looking for from the contract, what needs to go in that contract, what's key based upon your business and your business needs. So that should all have been done beforehand. So when you, your employee decides that they would like to join you, it's fait accompli as far as the rules and regs and the uh, clauses that you want to provide them with. It's set, they sign, or they don't get the job. If you try to introduce contracts retrospectively, you can sometimes have problems with that because you're possibly um, asking them to sign something that they do not recognise as part of the original agreement that you had with them when you engaged them. So yet again, you're leaving yourself open if they've got more than two years service before you do this, and I know lots of companies that have tried, um, you leave yourself open to claims for constructive dismissal. So it's pretty key that you provide a contract of employment at a very, very early stage. Also disciplinary and grievance procedures. They're fairly important. Um, most companies would understand that if you fail to offer disciplinary grievance procedures to your staff and then you discipline someone and you fail to follow at least the guidelines that the ACAS Code of Practice lays down, you leave yourself open to uh, higher levels of uh, a fine being awarded to the individual. Up to 25% can be garnished onto a, a, a fine if the court feel that you have not used the ACAS Code of Practice. So yet again, having your own set of disciplinary grievance procedures, which is based on the ACAS Code, but is fit for purpose for your size of business, is pretty key. You don't want to be trawling through 185 pages of the ACAS Code of Practice trying to identify what you should be doing if someone either raises a grievance or you want to discipline someone. So it's better to have uh, a crazy version that's useful for your business and meets the needs of your business. I, uh, I'm working with a client at the moment and they, they yet again have some redundancies to make. I've been through about six years now where lots of companies have contacted me because they need to make cutbacks. We've been through a, a very difficult period, everyone knows it, and the amount of people I've made redundant in total over that period must be getting on, and these are all small, small businesses, must be getting on for over 1,500. So it, it's an area that I know quite a lot about. And I went to see this one particular co company who were recommended to me uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we're now beginning a recruitment 
uh, redundancy process, which is a great pity. Um, but those kind of things happen. And the first question I asked him was, do you have any contracts and employment in place? <laughs> no. Do you have any disciplinary grievance procedures in place? No. Do you have a redundancy policy by any chance? No. So we're starting from scratch. So none of these people have contracts, which will make it more difficult. Uh, and none of, the, none of them have received any information with regards to the procedures that will be involved. So we're having to draw all those up. And I will be charging you for that, obviously. But they're having to be drawn up now before we can take the next step. So, looking at if you decide that a situation isn't working out with an employee, how do you dismiss? Well, the government very kindly opened the window up and they've moved it out to two years now as the qualifying period. So that sort of suggests that between you, you know, the start date and beginning of year two, you're absolutely fine to just dismiss. That's not the case. You still have to follow a formal process. If you're dismissing someone, there has to be a formal process where they have the right to be accompanied, they're invited to the meeting in writing, minutes are taken, and there is an appeal structure. So, yet again, this is where your disciplinary procedures come in handy. Um, so, if you dismiss early on, you only need to hold that one formal meeting, but you do need to hold it. Failure to do so can give rise to claims of a statutory breach uh, um, of their rights, even though they've got less than two years service. So, and also be aware that because of the window moving out, a lot of people are trying to bolt on, if they possibly can, discrimination claims. If they're over to your window, then you have to use some form of disciplinary procedure if it's conduct. If it's their capability, you have to use some form of improved performance review process. So yet again, it's all down to the documentation you've got and you've utilised or you utilise it. So it's important to make sure that you've got this in your armoury. I found this, which I thought was highly amusing, on the government website. The government is supposed to small, support small to medium-sized businesses. After all, this country is the backbone of this country is based on small to medium-sized enterprises, and this is what they've got out there. Your employer can also put their disciplinary procedures in your employment contract, and if your employer does this and then doesn't follow those procedures, you could sue them for breach of contract. I think that's absolutely amazing. I really do. Um, whoever said they were on our side. So, it, it, for me, it's even more critical that you get it right and that you protect yourself and your business by making sure you've got the documents that you need. And always, always make sure that your procedures are non-contractual. Disciplinary procedures, grievance procedures, redundancy procedures, your absence reporting procedures, none of it has to be contractually binding. All you have to do is state that they're your rules and regulations and you will abide by them. That's all you need to do, which means you will never have that breach of contract claim against you. So it's well worth looking into things like that. So, who do I recommend? Um, well, obviously me. Um, but don't look at large providers. There are loads of large providers out there. And I can name one for you, it's Peninsula. A lot of companies do know them. A lot of companies use them. You are tied in for either a one, three or five year contract and depending upon how much you're willing to spend and if you want to save some money, you, a lot of people go for the five years. It's extremely expensive. They give you huge wads of documentation, which nine times out of 10 you'll never look at. <coughs> Um, and they say that it's free, but don't be fooled, you're paying for it because they charge more than any other company out there for the services. The service is a HR helpline, and when you need them, you can call them. You will speak to a different advisor on every single occasion. You will often get conflicting advice. Uh, so, from my perspective, large providers do not hold up the key and the answers for small businesses and small business owners. You're much likely to get a better service from a smaller provider. Um, they will get to know or should get to know you and your business extremely well. You know, I have clients who ring me up and say, hi Sue, sorry to bother you, but it's Mary again. I know who Mary is. 
I know the problems they've had in the past with her. I know what they've done to date and what we've done to date with that particular individual. You will not get that benefit from a large provider. You will have to go back to square one because you'll speak to a different advisor each time and you'll have to explain thoroughly what you've done and how you've done it. Um, ACAS can be very, very useful. They offer a great conciliation service at this moment in time, which only came into force last year. And one of my clients has had the need to use it. Um, and it's quite an interesting story. So are you interested in hearing it? Would you like to hear it? Yes. Yes? yes? Oh, good. Uh, it's a bit lighter than all the heavy stuff. Um, very good company. Uh, they've got an excellent track record. They do their best. There's their, uh, 50 employees. Um, they're doing extremely well at the moment. They're in the castings industry. And they had a potential claim from an employee who stated that he had his statutory rights breached. Uh, he'd been dismissed within the two year window, but he was raising this claim because his breach had been, his rights had been breached because he had raised a claim with the company that smoking was going on on site. And because of that, he'd been dismissed which I found quite unusual. So I went in and uh, they asked me to investigate the situation because they had a very clear cut reason why they dismissed him. However, it wasn't well enough documented. So I looked at the reasons and it turned out that this chap was uh, a manager on the, on the floor in the firm And the one day he decided, in his own wisdom, to clean out one of the furnaces that was over 40 feet high and he accessed it by a ramp. And he went up the ramp, stood on the top of the furnace, which was working at the time. <coughs> Temperature in there is over 300 degrees. And leaning over the top, scraping the sides. If he had <coughs> fallen in, obviously he would have been dead. But more to the point, the splash back from that would have killed and made many of the sides who were all inside that building. So that's why they called him to a disciplinary hearing. That's why they dis dismissed him eventually. And he, he had an appeal hearing as well, and that failed. So he raised this claim. Yet again, these are, you may consider them to be spurious claims, but they are accepted by the tribunals. So I then was asked to negotiate and liaise with ACAS. And their conciliation service is very good. However, as I've said there, it's a bit like shutting the stable door after the horse has already gone. Because if, he'd, if they'd have followed the process correctly and they'd have logged everything, this case may never have arisen. It wouldn't have even got as far as I was. Um, but I managed to negotiate a £3,000 settlement, which is what he was looking for, down to a reference. That's all he walked away with in the end was a reference because I was able to provide sufficient evidence to say that he, his, the reasons why he was dismissed was nothing to do with what he claimed. So APAS do have their benefits, uh, but as I said, you know, just be careful how you use them and when you use them because their bias is usually on the side of the okay. Now that's me. That's all I'm going to bore you with today. Um, I know, you know, hopefully it's been useful. Um, I've produced some of these sheets with just the questions and some of the answers on that I've given you today of my presentation. And I've got some copies with me, so if anyone does want them, by all means, I'll provide you. A copy. Is, is there information that is available with the, all these simple or standard contracts uh, already in there for us to follow? Right. Um, if you go on to ACAS, you'll find some bog standard templates. Um, if you're a member of the FSB, you'll find some bog standard templates. If you just go on to general Google and key in contracts of employment, you will come up with loads of alternatives. Um, it's up to you whether you choose a bog standard template or whether you decide to use a HR provider who will build one bespoke to your needs and your business. It's entirely up to you. What's the uh, standard price for these contracts? It depends on the provider. If you're talking about getting something free off a website, that's what it is, it's free. You fill it in. Um, you pass possibly will not know whether the content is suitable for your business. Um, 
but because it's free, you take the gamble, you take the risk. Um, if you're looking for someone like myself to provide it, it depends on who the provider is. I uh, am well aware that there's lots of HRs out there. Um, quite a number don't have as many years of experience as I do, and so their charges would be relevant to their experience. But the higher up the food chain you get, the more they will charge for a contract. Solicitors nowadays, I'm not entirely certain. So, do we have any solicitors present? Roughly, how much would you charge for a contract of employment? Would you three, hours, three hours work. So, so if you get someone fresh out of school, then what, 25 an hour? Right. If you get someone who's into it, say, in 20 years, up to 250 an hour. Yeah. But Oh, no, you could, it's that contract you do on a fixed fee, so what you could do is if you used a minimum landlord, but uh, you'd probably charge on your say T50 to £10,000. Yeah, it depends what sort of contract it is. Yeah, yeah. it uh, does depend on the contract, very much so. You know, if you're talking this, about your usual hourly paid employee or salary paid employee, that's a good rule of thumb. Um, but as I say, everyone differs and it will, it will depend upon what you want to see in that contract. Question. Imagine a, a company or a firm and it's 100, 100 people uh, mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. Everybody there gets a payslip and a P60. Mm -hmm. However, only five of them have fixed income. The other 95 of them, mm -hmm. the payslip is variable depending on what they sell. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Would the standard templates work or would we need to? Uh, have someone, for example, like you said, to custom make the difference between those 95 kilos and those five admin? Mm, good question. I would say that the contract should be different. Yeah. Um, so, yes. Because the admin, they have to turn up at yeah. night. They have to leave. Oh, they don't have to leave. Right? No, no, but they do. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Whereas the VOs, they come in at, say, 7 and they leave at 10. Yeah. Because otherwise they don't get paid. No. Just because they're saying, yeah, technically I'm employed, mm. but if you do no work, there's no money. Mm. So the hours and everything, there's going to be a bit of a grey area there. There is. And this is my worry. I would say you would, you would be technically looking at a separate type of contract, yeah. even if it just covers off the hours, etc. But you've also got, don't forget, the decisions with the latest cases that are going through with regards to commission payments. Yes. And overtime. Yes. And it will affect bonuses. They almost sound self-employed. But it's going through appeal at the moment. Yeah, that's the thing. But you should have a contract. can't be self-employed because the HMRC people will say, well, we need a separate source of income because if all of your income is coming from that particular source, yeah. you're employed. They, they will catch that's you out. That's the biggest problem. So I yeah. yeah. They, they will catch you out. You know, it's, it, it, a lot of people, you're absolutely right, and they, they, they just ask people, you know, you're self-employed, send me an invoice and we've resolved the problem, but if the HMRC pick up that the only invoices that you're sending out to this one particular company, then it could well be What they want is employers and I, mm. yeah? But what, what I'm saying is, I'm happy to pay it. I'm not going to pay you just for being alive and sat behind the desk. Mm. Yeah, you have to justify your existence. So when you need to shop, <laughs> what's you can do is essentially draft contracts and have employ people to get around that in rather than employed. Uh, so if they're telling us about seven, if you show them your contract to start with fixed hours, then that's one of the things that show that they're self-employed. Uh, if they're not bringing you tools to the trade, you're providing them, then that shows they're self-employed. Yeah. So to get around an eye problem, you probably need to get some I'm happy to pay the yeah. people. I want something back for it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's the issue here. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I'm not going to pay them because they're alive. No, no. No, I think you do need to separate <laughs> That's what you're talking about. That you get, not some of the others. I think hourly paid or even zero hours. Yeah. The only thing you can't include in the zero hour now is restrictive covenants. Have the you, rest um, is still Google there. zero hour contract. Oh, yeah. I don't know how many lefties are against this. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, the government have been against it for years, and they've yeah. been, you know, Vince Cable's been on its case now for about two or three years. But they haven't banned them. All they're doing is restricting what you can put in them. It doesn't mean to say you can't use them. Yeah. Um, sports director still using it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the tip off. Yeah.
Um, so, a question with regards to self employer for using subcontractors, isn't it more than just the fact of somebody bringing tools or working out of the side desk that they get goes across the boundary to become self employed? Yeah, there's, there's a Even range. If they're, if they're going to get an income from two sources, there, there is a range. For example, if they're wearing your uniform, uh, if they're 